It's really a pleasure to be here tonight, and we want to thank you for in inviting us um, to come to Dryden, uh, um, which is rightly famous for uh, its ban on fracking and standing up to the industry in court. Um, and many of the folks here tonight have been involved in the ongoing local and statewide efforts to um, seek alternatives to expanding our dependency on fossil fuel. Um, to meet our, our energy needs here in Tompkins County. And so I want to uh, just say that it's been an honor to be working with so many of you on this project. And we're, we're glad to be here tonight to share with you uh, some of what we've learned about building and heating with the climate in mind. And let's see, there we go. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to set the context a little bit. Um, Ithaca and Tompkins County are facing a really complex set of problems that are interlinked and therefore the solutions will be interlinked. <clears throat> we have this ongoing um, housing crisis uh, in terms of having this constant need for building, adding more housing um, that's affordable for people at all income levels. And of course we want to see entrepreneurs be able to launch their businesses and create meaningful work at living wages. Uh, I think everybody is, is um, on board with that vision. But at the same time, we have these climate commitments. Both the city and the county have committed to reducing their carbon emissions 80% by 2050. And of course, on top of all that, we'd like to pursue these goals in a way that's equitable, that's fair to everybody in our community now and into the future. And uh, it's true that if we were to pursue a business as usual approach to solving this set of problems, they could come into conflict with each other. But we believe that there is an emerging and very clear path forward in which we can provide adequate housing support business development and accept our responsibility um, to do our part to, in terms of climate stabilization and achieving true energy security. <clears throat> But we're going to need to work together to figure out how to do this because it is very complex. It's just that um, I think that even as we come up against that complexity, it's important to remember that this is the work that needs to be done. And what's this set of problems that we're facing here in Tompkins County is a microcosm of what's facing humanity on planet Earth. So it's a problem set that has to be solved. And uh, we're going to have to... Um, to work together on it, and of course, anything that we can figure out, we can share with other communities. But as we do this work together, we're going to come up against some pretty difficult decision points. Our group of citizen volunteers, there's been about 40 people involved in this effort, um, we came together in response to one such decision point, which was NYSEG's proposal to build a seven-mile gas pipeline from Freeville over to Lansing to supply new residential and commercial development um, with methane for mostly space heating and uh, hot water. Now this pipeline could carry over 700,000 cubic feet per hour of methane, and that makes it a very significant decision point for us in this community. Um, because if we go forward with that, it really will make it very difficult, very difficult to uh, make progress on our climate goals. But at the same time, you know, a lot of local businesses are very worried about our ability to add housing and expand businesses um, if we don't get that pipeline. So um, our talk today hopes to address some of those concerns. Um, we've noted a number of assumptions that tend to be made by the people who advocate in favor of the pipeline. and. Um, uh, we've got them up here. Um, they tend to believe that alternatives are not uh, viable or affordable, uh, available to people. And they note that methane has been the cheapest fossil fuel in recent years to buy, and they don't think it poses that big of a risk in terms of economic or environmental hazard. And um, they tend to believe that methane has lower environmental costs. 
um, than other fossil fuels, especially coal. So tonight we're going to mostly look at uh, the first two assumptions because our community hasn't had that much of an opportunity to learn about space heating, alternatives for space heating, whereas especially here in Dryden, you know all about the problems with fracking. So I'll turn it over to Bryce from here and uh, he'll walk us through his findings. Thank you, and, uh, and I thank you again for coming out tonight. Um, if you have questions along the way, certainly feel free to ask them. We also have time at the end for more questions. Um, so we're going to run through three different pieces of the analysis. What we started with was one of the large developments that's going in near the area where this proposed gas pipeline is going to be uh, serving. We wanted to look at what are the options for big multifamily developments. So the first thing we wanted to identify were technologies that were uh, very viable, technologies that were well commercialized. This is the number of ground source heat pumps that have been shipped in the United States. And it just helps to give you an idea that these are not a little niche technology. Uh, over the last decade, we've had quite an increase in the number of these shipments. 2009 is simply the most recent year we have data for. And this trend continues. These are technologies that have really improved uh, and expanded quite a bit in the last few years. So we took a project that was already uh, in the pipeline, so to speak. Uh, it's the Village Solars. It was the expansion of the Village Circle. So the orange boxes are the existing housing units. The red boxes are what they're planning to add. This is a fairly large development. It's 312 new apartments uh, to add to the 158 that are already there. It's a fairly dense development. We uh, picked this one because there was enough information in the public domain that we could actually create the energy models and look at what the options were. Most of the units are constructed out of these little boxes. So there's three stories tall, there's four units across. So they come in these blocks of 12 units and those are just repeated over and over and over again. So the analysis that we're going to talk about tonight is really for one of these 12 unit blocks and then it's simply a whole bunch of those to make the size. And it turns out Village Solars has already looked at a number of sustainability features and so they were an interesting case study. So two in particular that I've highlighted here, they've designed the buildings to take into uh, a maximum use of solar heating in the winter time. So they have solar gain in the winter and they have awnings that will block solar uh, gain in the summertime. And they have glazing or windows on the front and back to try to create pass through cooling in the summer. So it was already a design that was giving some thought to the energy footprints that they had. What we wanted to look at was what are the options if instead of building these simply to code, what if you created a smarter building envelope and then used uh, one of the alternative to fossil fuels, one of the heat pump technologies. So to analyze this, we adopted a methodology that DOE uses whenever the energy code changes. Uh, this is uh, a methodology that's used all over the country, so it provides a nice base case. The other piece of it is that the DOE maintains a cost database for all of the technologies. So all of the cost figures that we used were uh, simply now nice verified common uh, numbers. The only time we varied uh, from the DOE numbers were for the actual uh, heat pump installations. We used local pricing because those can vary more uh, greatly. So we started out with the existing building code. At the time the Village Solars was proposed, it was the 2009 building code. This is still what New York uh, is using today. So this was our business as usual. Uh, when we started this work last uh, uh, fall, it looked like the 2012 building code was likely to be adopted. So we looked at that. But we also wanted to do better than simply built to the best, uh, to the existing code. So we looked at what was called a smarter energy building. And so as a goal, we took a 20% increase. What we wanted was a building that would be 20% more energy efficient than the energy code uh, for 2012. And the idea for 20% is that's a commonly uh, used number. For instance, LEED, the Green Building Certification, their first lead points are a 20% improvement off of baseline. Similarly, uh, Executive Order 88 that Governor Cuomo 
Cuomo issued was for a 20% reduction in the energy use of all state-owned buildings. So 20% is sort of our first uh, number. And it turned out that in order to get that 20%, we're not having to adopt radical building technologies. It was simply three key changes. One was to double the thickness of the insulation. So instead of one sheet of insulation on the outside, you put two sheets of insulation. The second one was you have uh, insulate your hot water tanks rather than leave them exposed. And then the uh, last one was to add heat recovery to the ventilation. So this allows you to capture back some of the heat that you would otherwise have lost when you vent the air out of your apartments. And so if we looked at the three models, business as usual, this was the current building code. If you were to build it to the 2012 code, you would get a, uh, about a 27% reduction. This is mostly through a tighter envelope. Are improvements off of the building code, the smarter building, another 22% reduction? So all told, our building would use about uh, half as much energy, 46% reduction. So that's a big reduction, but to give you a sense that this is not some radical uh, building that's the best you could possibly get, I always love this slide. This is a retrofit out of Germany. These are infrared images before and after they fixed the envelope. Uh, after making these changes, they achieved a 90% reduction in the energy on-site energy use of the building. So our 46% is, is good, but this is not a passive house and not a really radical building design. Now, Village Solar, as I said, was already looking at some sustainability features and had an improved envelope. And so they, uh, their envelope was already better than the existing building code by about 16%. But our smarter building would still be about another third uh, reduction from there. So there's still improvements that we could recommend. In terms of the actual technologies for heating, we chose to focus in on two technologies that were uh, very advanced and commercially available. The first is ground source heat pumps. Ground source heat pumps uh, use the same kind of refrigeration technology that you would have in a window air unit or your refrigerator at home, and it allows you to extract 50 degree uh, uh, heat from the ground and uprate that to provide 100% of your building heat, uh, really for any size buildings. For very large buildings or very large heat loads, economically you might begin to look at other uh, technologies like biomass, but geothermal really can heat any buildings. And we'll show you a couple of very large buildings that have geothermal in a bit. The last piece is because you're using the ground to extract energy, for every unit of energy you put in to run the pumps and to actually run the heating system, your house gets three units of heat energy into it. So as an efficiency, we have 300% efficiency. So this is what you can compare to your natural gas furnace. That's around 95% efficient. 95% of the energy you, show, you put in shows up. Here, 300% of the energy you put in turns up and shows up in your home because the other energy is simply extracted free from the ground. The other technology we look at is air source heat pumps. They are very similar to ground source. They use the same refrigeration technology. Only now, instead of trying to extract heat from a 50 degree ground, you're trying to extract heat from the air in uh, winter. And then you're trying to reject heat or dump heat in the summer into that same hot air. So they're simply a little bit less efficient. So instead of 300% efficient, you have 200% efficiency. And this technology has very dramatically improved, uh, they now have models that can operate to temperatures as low as minus 13. So they can be used uh, really in uh, our climate with quite a bit of uh, certainty. And when you combine those two or three hundred percent efficiencies with our smarter building, here's where you get the really big reductions in overall on-site energy use. So here's our building as usual using natural gas for heat. If you built it with the smarter envelope, the tighter building, and you built it with the heat pump, you can now see that we can eliminate 80 percent or 75 percent of the total energy. So it's a huge change from the on-site energy use. And of course, this doesn't come for free. So the question now is, how does all the economics of this work out? 
So uh, there, what we wanted to look at was the upfront cost of building the smarter building and using the heat pump technologies. What does that look like as an investment? How much do you get when you look at the return from the energy savings? So again, using those numbers from DOE for the cost of insulation and air sealing and our cost for heat pumps, what we found is that for those 12 block unit apartments, it's about fifty to sixty thousand dollars of additional cost up front to build the smart building. If you break that down per apartment so you can compare it to things like granite countertops or other fancy bits you might put into an apartment, it's about four or five thousand dollars per unit is the additional cost that we're talking about here. So when we uh, actually met with the architect who's designing this and we talked with them about the cost of their building, what we found is it's about two and a half to three percent increase. So it's a, uh, it's a relatively modest increase and we'll see that that's well below uh, what we find uh, and consistent with the national average. But this investment is an investment. It's not simply a cost that you're going to bear. So the question for us was, what does it take to make this look attractive to a developer? How much do they have to recover in order to make this a return on their investment? So uh, what we asked for was, we looked at a 12% pre-tax rate of return. Talking with developers, we saw that we would want to have this return in about five years, and they would want a cash flow positive after six months uh, from the end of construction. So we built into our economics the question of meeting this type of return and meeting those cash flows. And what we found was that it would require a relatively modest increase in the, over, in the rent that you would charge. This is what we call our rent premium. So over the 30 years of the systems, you're going to save quite a bit of money on the energy costs. So you're saving forty to $88,000 in energy costs. So those energy savings are going to be part of this return. The remainder is a rent premium that you would pay to have these lower and more secure energy bills. And what we found is that the higher upfront cost of geothermal, because you have to dig the trench to put the ground loops in or drill the wells to put the ground loops in, and ground source heat pumps cost a little more up front, but they're more efficient, so they have more savings over time. And in the end, there really isn't a strong economic argument for one over, or the other. Both of them came out with a rent premium around $47. These uh, uh, apartments that we modeled, the Village Solars, these are meant to be market rate apartments. So they were going to be uh, rented for about $1,000 a month, and so this represents about 4.5% uh, increase in the overall overall rent. Now this, of course, doesn't have to be uh, the way that you work this, right? These were designed with existing structures that you were modifying the design, and they were meant to be market rate. When you want to look at affordable housing, there are examples in our area that have built more efficient buildings for less money than we're actually talking about the base price for these buildings. The base square foot cost is actually higher than what some uh, green buildings have come in in our area. So this was our totals. We had about a 4.5% increase in the rent, coming from about a 25 to 3% increase in the overall construction cost. The remainder is from the financing of this. And so the question was, could we expect developers to be able to recover these costs? So the DOE has studied these types of buildings around the country, and Far too much text they put on their slide that I copied here. But the numbers you want to focus on are the rent premiums, higher retail rents. And if you notice, the smallest rent premiums they found were around 7 to 8%. Remember, we would only need 4%, 4.5% to recover our costs. They were finding lead buildings commanding a premium of 15% or more. So these rent premiums are quite uh, reasonable compared to what we see. And those rent premiums come from higher occupancies, lower utility costs, a faster and higher sale price. And then the last piece here is construction costs. They generally find an increase of around 2%, and that's consistent with what we found for our buildings, 25 to 3% increases. So from the standpoint of a developer, this looks pretty good, right? There's a pretty strong economic argument that you could build the smarter building with the uh, electric heat, the high efficient electric heat, rather than the natural gas fossil fuel infrastructure, and you could make a return on in this investment, a fairly healthy return. 
And in this, we have attempted to be as conservative as possible, keeping as many of the assumptions on our side as possible, so any changes would only make this look better. So I'm going to hand this off to Melissa. She's going to walk you through some of those pieces and talk about where we've been uh, fairly conservative in our analysis. Hey, thank you, Bryce. Um, so, so just to continue and pick up where Bryce left off, uh, this is a conservative analysis. The first thing that we show here is that we're not taking advantage here of any tax credits. Uh, so currently, there is a very nice tax credit for building these type of smarter buildings. Um, it's NYSERDA's does low-rise residential construction program. And you can see, if I point at it, um, this top section here, it's about $2,000 per unit that they're willing to give developers for constructing these type of smarter apartments. So if you remember from the previous slide, to actually build the smarter building with a ground source or air source heat pump, we're talking about an additional cost of four to $5,000. If the developer wants to take advantage of this tax credit, immediately $2,000 of that goes away. So those economics in terms of developer profitability, that's without this involved at all. Uh, this program's in place currently through the end of 2015, uh, and I sort of expect to continue it, extend it, and, and it's been successful and it's something they want to continue to promote. The other piece here is, is the third tier. So there's also, they actually increase the tax, the uh, incentive that you get if you do solar. So, and that's why I'm up here is to talk about solar. Uh, so solar PV, when it comes in the mix here, it actually increases that tax credit from $2,000 per apartment to $4,000 per apartment. And again, the additional cost was four to five, so we're almost you know, offsetting 100% of the developer's additional cost by actually putting solar on one of these buildings to serve these apartments. And as I'm gonna talk about in a minute, we can go solar in terms of solar PV right now for no more cost than people are paying the utility currently. And so adding solar to get that higher incentive actually will not cost the developer any more money at all. Um, and this is the second slide focused on solar. This is obviously for you guys who have been out to Cornell's first array up on Snyder Road. This is two megawatts of solar, their first hopefully of eight more to come um, in the next eight months to a year. Um, so in order to relate this back to the Village Solars example that Bryce was walking through, it would be about one third of this system size would take care of the heating for, as he's gonna describe, phases two through five of that very large apartment complex. Phase one is already being built conventional. He's gonna go into the more detail, but phases two through five to do the heating would be about a third of this system size. Um, to do 100% of the baseload electricity plus the heating would be about three quarters of this size. Um, and we could actually, looking at all of the roofs for the buildings that are being proposed to be built for the apartments, we could fit about half of this system size on the roofs of those buildings alone. Um, and so with solar PV currently costing about the same, whether we build it in a big field like this or whether we put it on rooftops, about the same in a lot of cases as what folks are paying NYSEG, our local utility here today, developers can do this, get the higher you know, incentive or, or benefit from NYSERDA and actually improve even further the economics that Bryce just described. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit more about residential applications. When we do this presentation, we often talk a lot about commercial, um, a lot about multifamily. We're gonna focus a little more residentially here today because of where we are. Um, and so solar also, of course, applies to residential. And for any of you who came to Solar Tompkins events last year, you probably heard a, a bit about that. Uh, but residential can solar is continuing to grow exponentially in Tompkins County and in New York. And so all of these same principles would apply just as much to a single family home as they would to a multifamily building. Um, and with community shared solar, which is now currently going to available and going to be even improved in the next few months by the Public Service Commission, if you're one of those folks who doesn't have a suitable roof, uh, doesn't own their own building at this point, you're able to go solar now, or you will be soon, without having to put that facility on your own building in a less than optimal or you know, not super feasible way. So we're really gonna be opening up this residential market even further than we have, and we expect modeling the economics for the next several years for them to continue to be at very much cost parity with the utility. Meaning you do not have to put money up front, you do not have to pay more to switch to clean electricity. Um, other conservative things in this analysis so far, uh, no credit taken for air conditioning. So of course the heat pumps that Bryce mentioned, ground or air source, provide cooling. Um, at no additional cost. You need to make sure you have the right distribution, uh, but there's no additional cost for cooling, and we have not put that in here, nor any premium that people pay for centralized high-efficiency cooling. 
Uh, we also have used the very low, kind of low base case costs for natural gas in terms of what its price is and the models that he just did. Um, so if indeed we see higher prices, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, uh, that would only improve, further improve the situation in the picture. Um, and then of course, as well, a lot of you know and have been involved with in the fracking conversation the last, you know, what is it, almost half a decade, um, we're not, we're, you know, often we're here to talk about climate commitments, but we have not put a dollar figure on that for the case of this developer example and the economics that we've shown. So the real externalities that we're not currently monetizing, they do have a cost, and when you put that in, that just again is icing on the cake here, makes this case even more compelling. So as uh, Linda mentioned at the beginning, so we think that when we ran through the numbers, it's a fairly compelling case, right? But we're the eggheads, right? So when you know that this actually makes sense is when the business people actually start putting the money down. And what we found, and we did not pick Village Solars because of this, um, what we found is as we were working with them, we found that they had actually made the decision independently to switch at least phase two of their development into air source heat pumps. So phase one are these first three buildings, A, B, and C, and they're already under construction, nearly ready for occupation. These are going to be with natural gas. Uh, D and E here are phase two, and pending the final work with NYSEG, they are going to switch these now to air source heat pumps. The decision on the rest of the development is uh, still there working on that. Their decision here came about because the developer had talked with other developers who had used air source heat pumps and were very happy with them, and they found that the economic arguments that we're making here made sense for them as well. And so uh, this was actually going to be a really remarkable case study they're going to have buildings that are built identical to one another, these three with gas, these with heat pumps, and it's going to be a remarkable way for us to actually see this work out in a really, really kind of unique case uh, study. Now, how this ties in uh, to the pipeline is goes beyond just this one facility. Village Solaris is a big user, and if all of those 312 apartments were built with natural gas, it's a lot of gas that would be required. If they were now to switch phases two through five away from natural gas and to air source or ground source heat pumps, they would displace the need for an awful lot of gas supply. And in fact, when you work it out, it's enough gas to provide uh, about 100,000 square feet of commercial space. If you built the commercial space better, if you built the commercial space with a smarter envelope, you would be able to build almost 220,000 square feet of that commercial space and power it with natural gas. And so this now gives you a, us a way where if big users are able to make this switch and reduce the increased demand for natural gas, now it becomes a question of whether we really need to increase the supply or whether we can pull enough of the demand off the existing supply so that the users who really do need natural gas for high heat, uh, process heat and the like, could actually have access to it. But we're taking natural gas and turning it to electricity, so the question is, do we have enough electricity? Um, it turns out it's not a big amount. Uh, for Again, for all of those numbers, two through five, if they build all of them with air source heat pumps, its peak demand would be around 135 kilowatts. Right, so for those who don't uh, live and breathe energy numbers, that's two-tenths of one percent of the average electric load in Tompkins County. And it turns out it's actually better than that because our system is designed to meet the peak demand. And peak demand here comes in the summer still, and our new demand is adding winter demand. So if you look at 2015 here, there's 310,000 kilowatts of excess capacity in our region because it's designed to meet the summer load and not the winter load. So that's 2,300 times what we need for the Village Solars project, right? It's a lot of excess capacity that our system already has. The transmission system needs to uh, be considered, but we're not short of capacity. And if you look to 2024, this is with the assumption that the Cayuga plant was shut down. Then uh, these numbers are all built around the existing uh, assumption that in 2017, Cayuga goes down, is not repowered. The actual summer excess capacity will still increase in our region. They predict it to be 30, uh, 375,000. So there is quite a bit of excess winter capacity that we could tap into with these kind of technologies. 
contracted. And because we're talking about now not having a single contractor come in and put in natural gas, but we're talking about window companies and insulation companies and HVAC companies, all of that extra economic activity is going to mean more money in the local economy and it's going to mean more jobs. So again, about $135,000 to $160,000 of extra money, and this is actually what would stay in our community. So I've already taken into account the fact that if you buy a heat pump from a big national company, I'm not counting those dollars. Those are leaving our community. These are the ones that would stay behind, and it would add up to about four, uh, five to six new jobs just from that one Village Solars project. So it is good for economic development. So as Melissa mentioned, you can look at many of the same technologies for single family homes. And again, the numbers will come out very similar, it's just now on a different scale. So if you were to build a new single family home and your choice was again natural gas or building smarter with an air or ground source heat pump, there is an upfront cost. For a home it would be around thirteen dollars to $17,000 to build the home better. And if you mortgaged that into, if you financed that in your mortgage, it would work out to about $1 extra a month or $14 extra a month. But because of the advantages of solar, that fact that you can lock in that price uh, today, make a loan for 10 years, and then the rest of the life of those solar panels, they're producing free electricity, you actually would end up saving money if you switched to solar. You'd save about $36 to $40 a month. Similarly, if you're on propane now and your choice was do I convert to natural gas or do I do insulation and air sealing and make a heat pump, the uh, choice there, everybody's going to save you money. Right, so all switching to air and ground source heat pumps is going to cost you less than heating with propane. Switching to natural gas is going to cost you less. So the investment here would save you about 20, 15 to 25 dollars if you bought grid electricity, and you'd save 60 to 75 dollars if you switched uh, and also installed solar at the same time. These are the average savings over the lifetime of the system. So you actually would end up saving a larger amount of money switching to a more efficient home with the air and ground source heat pump and solar, not only would you now be fully net zero, you'd have no fossil fuel infrastructure that you're uh, using for building heating, but you would also save more than if you converted to natural gas. So we'll just mention very briefly some commercial developments. This, uh, these same technologies will work for us. Same basic technologies apply when we talk about commercial spaces. They're simply more varied and therefore each case study would be a little bit different, whether it's a retail space, a hotel, or some other type of commercial space. The heat pumps have improved quite a bit. And in commercial spaces, you get an extra layer of uh, help from heat pumps because big commercial buildings like this have very complex heat flows. Part of it is being heated by the sun. The other side is in the cold north side. And you can actually have commercial buildings today that are heating one half the building and cooling the other half of the building because they can't move heat efficiently inside. Heat pumps can do that. Heat pumps can optimize. You get big improvements, so this is just uh, cribbed from Cornell's uh, a study of their buildings. Office spaces, just like homes, can be built with better envelopes, and they found about the same types of reductions that they were hoping to achieve as we uh, found for the multifamily, around 47% reductions. Lots of uh, buildings in the area have made this choice. Uh, being from Cortland, I'm going to put the Cortland one up here first. Uh, this is the Professional Studies building, uh, opened a few years back. The new part of the building here is uh, powered by a heat pump. It's connected to an old building. And this is a neat example of a uh, really extensive retrofit. The old building it's attached to was not a high efficiency building. It was, in fact, the Cortland Overhead Door Company at one point. It was where we stored our tractor after that. Um, so this is a building that has had many lives uh, and is now part of our, uh, one of our need, uh, newest uh, spaces. The well field, the geothermal has uh, 40 wells drilled about uh, 350 feet into the ground. Um, there's lots of space around these buildings because there's lots of parking lots. They just simply drilled it under the parking lot and repaved over the top of it. 
So because this was part of a large project, uh, we don't have individual cost numbers the way we would for some uh, projects, but this represents our best estimate as to what the excess cost of the geothermal was. So the green line is our cost here. It's a little higher in year zero because we cost a little more, but over time the fact that it's going to use less energy and use electricity is going to save us money. We expect about uh, $100,000 in utility savings, uh, 12 year payback and the uh, university will make about a 7% return on this investment. So we will uh, make uh, a fair amount of savings from this piece. We're, of course, not the only ones that made this switch. This is the Peggy Ryan Williams Center, the administration building up at Ithaca College. Um, it's a big building, 57,000 square feet, powered by the heat pump there. Um, and uh, it's about 30% larger in terms of the heat pump capacity than SUNY Cortland's. Big heat pumps, uh, you will sometimes hear uh, stories about them. Uh, like any technology, you got to commission these well. Uh SUNY Cortland system uh, ran for a while, wasn't producing very much until someone looked at it and they found that they hadn't filled our glycol loops. They hadn't actually filled the well feel all the way, so it wasn't producing. Um, others uh, on this list, they uh, Argos in, they had some uh, decorative covers placed over the tops of their heat pumps, obstructing the air, uh, air flow and so the efficiency wasn't there. Those were found and fixed. Um, Lansing had a, a system that was working, then they changed the distribution system and the engineer hadn't taken into account some of the special things you have to do with heat pumps and therefore the new distribution system created some difficulties. And so with any of these technologies, care has to be taken with commissioning so that they run correctly. And when that's done, these systems do work very, very well. Our system is up and running now and has uh, performed the way we expect it to. So the last thing I'll mention here is just the economic uh, risks that Gay had started with. If we look at the history here, so the last sort of two decades of prices, what you find is electricity has been less volatile. So the red line is electricity, the green line is natural gas prices. And from a developer's standpoint, where developers are paying those bills, these big year-to-year -year swings in the cost of natural gas are troublesome. Those create unexpected amounts of cost in some years and, other, and not in others. Uh, electricity is a more stable price. Not only that, we're using less energy, so when you combine the two, the year-to-year -year swings would be about two to three times less. It's a much more stable energy price. Going forward, there's a fairly large uh, question about what exactly is going to happen to natural gas prices. So these represent two government estimates. Uh, the red line is the one that we've used, which is the, their low reference case. This comes from, their, uh, from the Department of Energy. The highest that we've seen from the government follows that green track there. And so over the next 30 years, there's about a 60% increase in cost if you follow that top line versus the bottom line. And so when you talk about energy security, that price wedge as we go forward becomes bigger and bigger. As we like to say, natural gas is energy familiarity, perhaps, more than energy security. And the best way is to use less energy, right? The best uh, kilowatt hour, the best BTU is the one you never actually put into your building. So using these, having these much uh, smaller on-site uses of energy are going to give us much more stable uh, prices and much more stable systems going forward. Okay. So I'm going to turn it back over to Gay to wrap it up, and then we can have any questions if you've got them. Thanks, Bryce. Well, to sum it up, we believe that um, there are just so many benefits that would accrue to our community if we forego making additional invest investments in fossil fuel infrastructure and instead um, put our efforts into retrofitting our existing buildings and making them more efficient, as well as um, encouraging all new construction to combine the smarter building design with renewable um, sources of energy and uh, especially using these heat pumps for space heating and hot water. I think overall the, the benefits are going to end up in us having a, a more resilient local economy. Um, 
the uh, housing is definitely going to be more affordable with, with uh, the better building designs and the heat pumps because uh, they'll be insulated from price spikes from that volatility. And that means that the residents in those apartments and homes um, will have more stable household economies and less of their money will be leaving town in the form of purchased fossil fuel energy. Uh, as you saw, we predict that there's going to be a strong return on investment for developers uh, of commercial or residential properties. And we find that overall job creation will increase because the entrepreneurs, the businesses that want to expand can still do that, but we'll be adding additional jobs in um, renewables and smarter building as, um, as Bryce went through with you. And importantly, um, we conclude that we can still support economic development in Tompkins County while we make progress on our climate commitments. We don't have to choose between jobs and the environment. Um, we need to solve both problems together um, simultaneously. And, uh, because ultimately, if either one doesn't get solved, it leads to systems collapse. So Tompkins County really is at a crossroads right now, uh, at an important decision point. And um, we believe the way forward is with smart design and pursuing renewable energy technologies. So we'd like to open it up to uh, any questions you might have in the remaining 10 minutes we've got. Thanks. <laughs> We'll be using a hand mic with the audience so that that, that can also be recorded. Right. Dave, you're up. Um, How's this? Okay. Yeah. Um, a couple of things. Uh, one, this building is heated with a ground source heat pump. Uh, it's very comfortable in here, and it's a pretty large size building, so um, it does work, and uh, nice to be living in. Uh, the second thing is, um, all gas pipelines, uh, they're also an ex uh, they're licensed to export money. Uh, a gas pipeline is a trade. When you have a gas pipeline in return for methane that's imported from afar, you have to export your money from this region to elsewhere. Or put it another way, you're also exporting your wealth and your, your real income in return for something which is kind of trashing the long-range viability of everything. So your so question stupid. is, Dave, your question is? My question is, <laughs> uh, how long do you think it's going to take people to actually see how, how this goes? In the, the one thing I would say is I, what we're already seeing with the Village Solars example is people are seeing this. Um, Ithaca College, uh, SUNY Cortland, you know, there are a number of institutions that are moving forward in these directions. Um, the community group that's been working on this, we are in March uh, hosting a workshop specifically for developers, architects, and those who work in these fields, um, hoping to be able to, to do exactly that, the outreach to the people who are looking at the next phases of development and try to get them to think about this uh, before they actually submit their plans. So it, it, it's certainly, I think, in the works, but it's going to take a lot more encouragement from, from the community to really want to see these technologies, want to see these offered offerings in their commercial spaces, in their multifamily homes, um, and then in their own homes as well. I was wondering, in the Acrylic Solars project, when you're installing the geothermal, will each building have its own loop field? How many compressors will there be? And will there be zone heat so each, depart each apartment can have its own temperature? The Village Solars is going to be using air source heat pumps, so they're, they're not going to have loop fields. Um, they, they have plenty of space for them, but they've made the choice to go with the air source heat pumps first. The, each individual apartment will be heated individually. Um, each one has its own uh, hydronic system that's going to be controllable within the apartment itself. Um, exactly how many compressors goes beyond my current knowledge, but we could probably figure it out. I, I was surprised to hear about hydronics because I thought it was all like forced air when you uh, use these systems. Doesn't the hydronic require a higher temperature? Doesn't that reduce the efficiency? 
you can use them with all types of distribution systems. Uh, some are easier than others. Uh, the hydronic systems that know that you're going to be using the ground source heat pumps are simply designed a little bit different so they can use the 110 degree water rather than the higher temperatures. Um, if you have baseboard heat that's heated with natural gas, those can't be directly converted into the, the heat pumps. Those have to be specially designed. But hydronic systems do work uh, with these systems. So um, b because I was in the mode of thinking about the cost of repowering Cayuga, it occurs to me to ask, what does it cost to build this pipeline, just this simple distribution line um, through West Dryden? Uh, because obviously that's a huge cost that ratepayers will be paying. The only thing I saw was the, an estimate of $14 million for yeah, that like pipeline. Like the ballpark, right? So it's interesting to throw that into the equation. That's a fixed cost that's just simply hands it off to us, um, all of us. Yes, it was expected that the rate payers would be, be paying that bill. My name is Bill Russell. I live over in Africa, but I'm the superintendent of schools down in Owego. Uh, in Owego, we were badly destroyed by the floods of 2011, and with FEMA funding, we're building a new elementary school, and you'll be interested to know that it's a 120,000 square foot building. It will be LEED certified. It'll be completely heated and cooled. Uh, with uh, ground source uh, heat pumps. It uh, has radiant heating, it has high efficiency glass. Uh, almost everything that we talked about here, this will be a state-of-the-art energy efficient and sustainable building that we're going to be very proud of. We're supposed to be opening sometime in, if I have my way, it'll be in uh, October or November. And I would urge you all to come down and see what a really uh, energy efficient new school looks like. It's going to be a gorgeous building. <laughs> I had a question about um, individual homes or not. Um, from, I, I've been looking at, I'm at a choice point myself, trying to decide to go with ground source or air source. And so, I mean, I see a, a conflict that I don't quite understand. The ground source is 50% more efficient. Mm -hmm but more costly, and you're saying it looks to me like over even over 30 years, the air source still ends up being cheaper. And to that, and... Well, let me just respond to the, uh, the, the, for the single family home, the air source heat pump is slightly more expensive. If you, uh, on that slide, it was the ground source would cost a dollar more a year and the air source would cost 14 more dollars a month on average. So the air source is slightly more expensive for the single family home. For the multi-family home, the cost difference was a lot less. It was only a dollar different between them. I, I read down monthly savings over 30 years. Um, when you have solar for a new home, if you're dealing with the propane conversion, uh, it, are you on propane now or fuel oil? Fuel oil. So uh, for the retrofits, um, every, all of the choices would save you money. Um, in that case, the uh, savings for the ground and air source heat pumps are a little bit closer together. Uh, your numbers on ground source are pretty low. Um, it depends on the, the ground source heat pumps depend on whether you can use horizontal or vertical uh, wells. So the numbers will depend on the site a little bit, but these numbers I think are pretty close to what you should see. And the, these are, remember, the net numbers. Uh, there's also the cost was questioning whether you convert it to natural gas or here. So the, there's also the cost savings from not converting to natural gas that you're, that you're comparing there. Yeah. Does it, does it so, um, the tax benefits, or it's, it's <coughs> yeah, the cost for the heat pumps were the net after the incentives. Yep. Um, another factor to consider when you make this decision is that these systems increase the value of homes. So it goes beyond payback. Um, I just wondered if you knew of any communities that have um, taken steps to encourage this kind of building with all the new construction. I don't know, maybe in terms of um, resolutions or requirements or financial incentives. Um, are there examples of how communities can make this happen more? 
Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. There, there are there are a number of communities that have looked at different models. Um, in fact, here in in Tompkins County, there are five cities that are currently uh, undergoing uh, the home energy disclosure project, and the idea would be to help incentivize people to build smarter. If when you sold a home or when you rented an apartment, you had to disclose up front what the monthly energy costs to operate the building would be, so you could really compare the cost of ownership, not just what the asset value is. Um, other kind of really low cost things that communities have done, when people come to apply for a building permit, the communities have created a list of all of the tax incentives and other things you might think about and little handouts about all of these technologies and when someone comes to put in a building permit they get a package with all of this information to help them kind of think through some of their options. So there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot that can be done and I'd be happy to share what I know about it. Hi. Quick question. Um, so given all this information and evidence, um, what's the incentive to do business as usual? <laughs> the, the, and the, the, the big problem that you run into is the split incentive. A developer who wants to take a building and, and sell it six months after they've finished construction where they don't then have to worry about the long-term energy costs of the building and so the incentive is to build the lowest cost thing you can get up front. Um, it's the same kind of standard split incentive with a rental property where the person who builds the building and the person who pays the energy cost costs are not always the same person. Um, those kind of split incentives are tricky to, to, to work around, uh, but again, in this particular model for uh, things like multifamily home, uh, most of the time a lot of uh, the natural gas is actually built into the rent, and so the developer themselves, the operator of the building, pays that heating cost. So it makes it a little bit easier in this case to get around some of those split incentives. But that, that's the main one. When the person who builds it and the person who pays that energy are not the same person. And I know that we've got to yeah. wrap it up here. It's also interesting to think that this idea of giving information to people, to, to builders as they come in to look for permits and so on, um, is really an exciting one. And we talk, just started talking about what kind of video clips we could have that you would ask people to look at. But so that's what's most exciting. People for the next meeting are actually waiting in the okay. lobby now. What's most exciting, I think, is that, is that, that you, it's selling itself. It, it just is already there, and that's what's so exciting. That In some ways, it's just a matter of people hearing this kind of good news. So let me just say, anyone who wants to stay and choose, I assume this is true, Bryce, Gay, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, there's We've dedicated the conference room, which is just straight down that long, low hall and turn left. We've dedicated that room. If you want to go talk to each other, that's the place to go do it to continue this meeting. Um, grab the chips and water pitchers and soda and cups in the lobby here and take them with you and enjoy. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. This has been really exciting to have such a great audience.